There are a few villains worse than the Nazis, and Wolfenstein Youngblood gives you ample opportunity to blow them up. From early run-of-the-mill varieties up through cyborgs and mechs that spew fire and fart laser beams, there's plenty of Nazi slaying on tap. What's not on tap, sadly, is ray-traced Nazi annihilation. It's coming! But Bethesda isn't saying exactly when the patch will arrive, which is a crying shame if you have a high-end RTX graphics card, because performance is generally high enough that a modest dip in frame rate for enhanced graphics might just be justifiable. We'll have to wait like everyone else, so in the meantime, let's look at how Youngblood runs right now. The good news is that just about anyone with a PC should be able to at least play Youngblood, though if you're running Intel integrated graphics or a potato, you may need to drop to 720p, minimum quality, and 50% resolution scaling to get above 30fps. For dedicated graphics cards, even a GTX 1050 will hit 50-60fps, to 60 FPS, while the RX 574GB and above can reach 60fps or more even at 1080p and maxed out settings. Or in Wolfenstein parlance, that's MEIN LEBEN quality. Hitting 60fps or more at 1440p and 4K and maximum, uh, sorry, MEIN LEBEN quality is also possible with an RX 580 8GB or GTX 1070 and above at 1440p and an RX 5700 or RTX 2060 and above at 4K. In terms of game settings, Wolfenstein Youngblood is another game that apparently believes more is better. There are 27 advanced settings to tweak, plus things like resolution, aspect ratio, V-Sync, field of view, and a few others. The advanced settings include four separate entries for filtering of different parts of the game, and many of the settings only cause a small change in performance and image quality. All of the GPU testing is done using an overclocked Intel Core i7-8700K running on an MSI Z390 godlike motherboard. I also use MSI graphics cards unless otherwise noted. MSI is our partner for these videos and provides the hardware and sponsorship to make them happen. That includes three gaming laptops that I'll get to later. For these tests, I'm using the low, high, and mein Leben presets at 1080p, with 1440p and 4K only tested at maximum quality. I also ran some tests with Intel and AMD integrated graphics at 720p, which required a different motherboard as well as CPU in the case of the AMD graphics. I'll start with these ultra-budget solutions for the real-time frame rate comparisons. AMD's Ryzen 5 2400G with Vega 11 graphics is easily able to handle 720p, generally staying above 60fps with occasional dips below that mark. Intel's HD Graphics 630, meanwhile, struggles at best, averaging just 22fps and with frequent dips into the teens. If you're hard-pressed for cash, you could maybe play Youngblood at minimum quality and use 50% resolution scaling to improve performance, but visuals look pretty fugly at that point, and you'd be better off with other games or with a hardware upgrade first. Switching to dedicated graphics cards, let's look at the recently released GTX 1650 and GTX 1660 from NVIDIA with AMD's RX 574GB and RX 590 as competition. If you're buying a new graphics card, this is as far down the stack as I'd recommend going. Basically, skip the budget GPUs like the GT 1030 and GTX 1050 or AMD's RX 550 and RX 560 because they're not really worth the price of admission these days. The RX 570 and GTX 1650 cost less than $150 and average well over 100 FPS with minimums dipping into the 80s. The GTX 1660 and RX 590, meanwhile, push prices closer to $200 right now with average frame rates of around 150 FPS. The AMD and Nvidia cards are otherwise mostly competitive with each other, with AMD winning many matchups based on lower pricing. In terms of the overall market, just about every discrete GPU tested will do 60 FPS at 1080p low, with the RX 560 and GTX 1050 being the two exceptions. Anyone with a 144Hz monitor will want at least a GTX 1070 or above to take advantage of the higher refresh rates. Even at the top, with the RTX 2080 and 2080 Ti, Youngblood doesn't appear to be hitting CPU limitations yet, which is a nice change of pace from other recent games. The medium preset isn't much of a change from low quality, so I'm stepping up to 1080p high next. In general, that drops performance about 15-20% to compared to the low preset, though cards with less than 4GB of VRAM may show a larger delta. I've kept the GTX 1650 and RX 570 and 590 for the frame rate comparisons, but I've moved up to the GTX 1660 Ti for the higher performance NVIDIA option. 
as far as performance goes, all of the cards are still easily breaking 60 FPS, even on minimum frame rates. Nvidia's 1660 Ti comes out on top, but only by virtue of being a more expensive card. Looking at the full results, the GTX 1060 3GB still averages more than 60 FPS, but minimum frame rates start to drop on many of the GPUs. If you have a FreeSync or G-Sync 144Hz display, the RX 570 and above all perform great, but if you want to max out a 144Hz refresh rate, you'll need at least the 1660 Ti or Vega 56. Also of note is how well AMD's RX 5700 cards do, using the latest drivers that fixed a consistent crash on Navi. The 5700 XT actually beats the Radeon 7, along with the RTX 2070. Skipping the Ultra and Uber presets and jumping straight to Mineleben, Youngblood continues to run well. Looking at the RTX 2060 and 2070 against AMD's Vega 56 and RX 5700, the 2070 easily wins from a performance perspective, while the 2060 and 5700 are basically tied, with pricing slightly favoring Nvidia's card right now. AMD's Vega 56 is mostly on the way out these days, but performance is still good and if you can find one on sale, it might be worth picking up. But considering the performance and efficiency benefits, AMD's new RX 5700 cards are the better buy. Looking at the full chart of GPUs, the RX 5700 XT ties with the RTX 2070 as well, though there's still the question of what ray tracing effects might do in the future on RTX cards. Nvidia's 10 series hardware meanwhile tends to lose to AMD's equivalent offerings in Youngblood, but of course Nvidia is now pushing the new RTX 20 and GTX 16 series GPUs. The RX 570 4GB still nominally squeaks by the 60fps mark, but the RX 580 8GB and even an old R9 390 are better options. For 144fps gaming, you'll want something at least as fast as a GTX 1080 Ti or AMD's RX 5700. And if you're gunning for 240 FPS, the RTX 2080 Ti almost gets there, though with minimums still far below that mark. 1440p is still my favorite monitor resolution, as it's high enough and crisp enough to look good and be useful for productivity applications without having so many pixels that it kills frame rate in games. Still, 3.7 million pixels is a lot, and you'll want as much GPU performance as possible. Looking at the 2070, 2080, Vega 64, and 5700 XT, performance is as expected. The 2080 and 2070 are ahead of AMD's cards, though the gap between the 2070 and 5700 XT is quite small. Vega 64 is the slowest of the four cards, but even that GPU mostly plungs along at a comfortable 90 FPS or more throughout the test. For 144 FPS, the 2080 often gets there but does dip occasionally into the 120 FPS range. Youngblood performance in general continues to be very good. AMD's RX 580 8GB and above all average 60fps or more at 1440p, with the GTX 1070 and above generally keeping minimum fps above 60 as well. Nvidia's Turing GPUs also continue to show an architectural advantage over the 10 series parts, with the 1660 Ti beating the 1080 and the 2060 even surpassing the 1080 Ti. That's better than in most other games, possibly thanks to an instruction mix that better utilizes Nvidia's new concurrent float and integer hardware. You'll still need the 2080 Ti for a steady 144 FPS or above, and thanks to the Vulkan API you can basically rule out multi-GPU SLI or Crossfire support. It's technically possible, but so far very few game developers have made the effort. What about maximum quality at 4K? Mein Leben indeed! As a nice change of scenery, however, several GPUs all average 60fps or more, with the RTX 2080 and 2080 Ti even keeping minimums above that mark. The ultra-expensive 2080 Ti also flexes its muscles and beats the closest competitor by over 25% thanks to the additional VRAM and bandwidth. AMD's Radeon 7 and RX 5700 XT continue to deliver similar performance, though minimum FPS on the Radeon 7 is a bit lower than expected. Probably there's room for a few additional driver tweaks, as there's no good reason a 16GB GPU with 1TB per second of bandwidth should do worse than a card with half the VRAM and bandwidth. Dropping below 20FPS in Youngblood makes the game effectively unplayable. There's massive lag and the game physics and movement slow down, so I dropped most of the slower GPUs from testing at 4K. Still, 
I wanted to at least try and show what happens with the 1063 gigabyte and GTX 970 so that you can see how much of a difference the amount of memory makes. If you don't quite have a beefy enough GPU for 4K at maximum quality, dropping down to the high preset probably won't be enough as that's only around 10% faster. 4K at medium quality will typically be 20 to 25 percent faster than what I'm showing in this chart however meaning the 1660 Ti and above should all average 60 FPS or more at 4k medium. Like Rage 2, Wolfenstein Youngblood cares more about your GPU than your CPU at least to an extent. It also happens to scale with more cores up to and beyond eight core processors based on my testing. At 1080p low, the Core i9-9900K typically sits in the 270 to 330 FPS range, more than most of us will ever really need for this sort of game. The Ryzen 9 3900X meanwhile is nipping at the heels of the 9900K, showing that more cores with a lower clock speed still keeps up in this game. At the other end of the performance spectrum, the Core i3-8100 and Ryzen 5-2400G still average well over 144 FPS, though minimum FPS is quite a bit lower. Ideally, you'll want at least a 6-core CPU for Youngblood to max out most graphics cards. At the maximum Mein Leben preset, Intel's 9900K reclaims the crown and keeps it for 1440p and 4K. Of course, at 4K any performance lead becomes largely meaningless, only the 2400G is slightly slower, probably because of the 8-lane PCI Express link limitation, while the rest of the CPUs mostly differ in terms of typical minimum frame rates. If you happen to be running a lesser GPU, which is over 99% of gamers based on the latest Steam surveys, differences in CPU performance will also be less pronounced. A GTX 1070 at 1080p maximum quality only averages 106 FPS, while even the 2400G can manage a minimum frame rate of 106 FPS. And if you're wondering, the Core i3-8100 typically delivers slightly better gaming performance on average compared to an older Core i7-4770K. Yep, it's probably time to upgrade from that 4th gen and earlier Intel CPU. For laptops, I'm limited to 1080p testing on the internal displays, but I realized there's another bottleneck with my test systems. The MSI GL63 and GS75 both have a single 16GB SO DIMM, meaning they're running in single channel memory mode. That appears to put the kibosh on higher performance, which means even at 1080p low, those two laptops average 90 to 95 FPS. Bump up to 1080p Meinleben and the GL63 and GS75 continue to hover near 90 frames per second, though just below it now. The beefier GE75 with a mobile RTX 2080, not the Max-Q variety, is in a similar situation, only it's about 70 frames per second higher. The good news is that MSI equips the GE75 with a 144Hz display, and it can make good use of that higher refresh rate in Youngblood. The bad news, as I said, is that the other two laptops, or at least my particular units, need a second memory stick to go dual channel and hopefully boost frame rates. Given the single channel memory issue on the 2060 and 2070 Max-Q laptops, I don't want to read too much into the current results. I've got two more 16GB SO DIMMs on the way to hopefully address the issue, and while I can't edit this video, I'll be sure to update the article with new performance results once I've upgraded the laptop memory. Thanks again to MSI for providing the hardware for our testing of Wolfenstein Youngblood. It's great to see high levels of performance from so many of the GPUs, though cards with 4GB or less VRAM are going to want to exercise caution in pushing some settings beyond the high level. But I have to say, as a hardware enthusiast, while I enjoy the game, I'm very disappointed in not being able to use the promised ray tracing effects right now. I'll see about doing more tests once the patch comes out, but it's another painful delay for owners of RTX hardware. I'm curious to see if the developers are able to wring more performance and quality out of the hardware via extensions to the Vulkan API compared to the DirectX ray tracing implementations we've seen to date. I'm also skeptical it will be the hoped for leap in graphics fidelity. Either way, stay tuned as I'll be checking out Youngblood's ray tracing implementation in the near future. We also have plans for several more major games in the coming months, including Borderlands 3, Control, Gears of War 5, and MechWarrior 5 Mercenaries. And hey, one or more of those might actually manage to ship with ray tracing effects enabled from day one. Thanks for watching.